What's up, y'all? Prof. Tim Taylor here. This is an impromptu stream. Uh, it's quarter to four in the morning on the first day of 2021. And I know I said I wouldn't be back live until the second Thursday, and I'm still planning on that. It's just that I felt really moved to come on and speak uh, to the new year and speak to everyone. Uh, that last live, uh, that last locator word that I had was really intense. That was one of the most intense prophetic words I've ever gotten from the Lord. And I was fearing and trembling and I was crying when the Lord gave it to me. And it was because the voice of the Lord is not a light thing. It's not a common thing. It's not a, it's not a trivial thing. It's not a small thing when you hear the voice of the Lord in any capacity. And so that that locator word was quite intense, but it's what the Lord said. And so, uh, you know, I'm happy to be used of God. I'm happy that the Lord would use me at all because the Lord doesn't need us. But I felt moved to come on because I just wanted to kind of share my heart, you know, kind of share my heart with like where I am and what I'm feeling and what I feel led to do. And because it's a new, it's a new year. It's the first day of the new year. I personally do not believe in resolutions. I think that new year's resolutions are kind of silly because, uh, you know, many times you don't stick to them. Many times they are unrealistic, <laughs> you know? And so I would rather just set goals because when it comes to goals, either you're gonna do them or you're not. So uh, my goal for the new year, my goal for 2021 is to increase my reach. I'll tell you why I want to increase my reach. The reason I wanna increase my reach is because uh, I know how many times the preached word or the prophesied word or the taught word has been a blessing in my life. It has saved me from some very low places in my life. Sometimes when I was just dealing with depression or dealing with very, very tough situations or situations I couldn't see my way out of or, or just things I couldn't figure out, things I couldn't understand. The thing that got me through without exception was when I heard somebody preach or prophesy or teach the word of God. So it's like the Lord said in Matthew 4, 4, that we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of his mouth. And I can say, hey, with confidence, no, no, that it's the word of God that brought me through some of my darkest times. And so one day the Lord was challenging me about when we're fighting our destiny, when we don't want to be who God calls us to be. And the Lord asked me, what do we lose if we lose Moses? And I thought about that. And the reason that's significant is because <clears throat> Moses did not want to be who he was. If you understand anything about Moses' story, you should understand that Moses did not want to be who he was. That's why he didn't get to it till he was 80 years old because Moses knew he was the deliverer. Then he tried to deliver Israel by his own hand and ended up murdering a man and then he ran. And then he set up a whole nother life that didn't have anything to do with that. He thought tending sheep for 40 years. So when you see the story about Moses in the, uh, the burning bush, Moses was 80 years old when that happened. I think President Jimmy Carter just turned 94 or 95. Well, that's the age range that Moses did everything he's famous for in from the ages of 80 to 120. And one of the reasons that took so long was because Moses did not want to be who he was. Moses did not want to be who he was. And sometimes when you have a call of God on your life, you don't like it. So the Lord challenged me one day and said, what do we lose if we lose Moses? We lose the Torah, it's what the Hebrews call the first five books of the Bible. We call it the Pentateuch. We lose the Ten Commandments. We lose the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. We lose the 10 plagues, the judgments on Egypt, the frogs, the lice, the brimstone, 
water turning to blood, death of the firstborn. The death of the firstborn is what created the first Passover. We put the blood of the lamb over there during the death angel passed over the houses. We lose the manna in the wilderness. We lose the quail from the ocean. We lose the water coming out of the rock. We lose the parting of the Red Sea. We lose the pillar uh, of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. We lose Pharaoh drowning in the Red Sea as the people crossed over on dry land. We lose all that if we lose Moses. So the Lord was trying to show me how your life is important. And it's important that you do with your life what the Lord wants you to do. And I just thought about that. And then I thought about like Bishop Jakes. I remember Bishop Jakes said one time what he would be doing if he wasn't Bishop Jakes. And he said he would have on blonde dreadlocks. He would be on a tropical island somewhere sipping kahulas or, or margaritas. And then he smiled and he said he found out that the Lord's plan was better. <laughs> he was like, but his plan was better. And that plan is really true. Because what happens if we lose Bishop Jakes? What happens if we lose Bishop T.D. Jakes? What happens? Then so much would be lost. And I can't tell you the number of times that tuning in to the bishop has completely blessed my life. And so anyway, and so I just wanted to share my heart that that's my goal for 2021 is to increase my reach because I believe that all of that stuff comes by the Holy Ghost. It's not that person. It's the spirit of God in that person. If the spirit of God be in me, then I want as many people as possible to hear what the Holy Ghost gives me to say. Because just like the words of other apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers changed my life and saved my life, then I believe the spirit of God can do the same thing through me. So when I come on, uh, every time I come on, I'm going to ask you to do one thing because I can't do that. I can't increase my reach without help, <laughs> not help, help, H-E-P, I need some help. So <laughs> I'm going to ask you to do one thing every time I come on. So the one thing I'm going to ask you to do this time is I'm going to ask you to, on the top of my Facebook page is a little button that says sign up. If you're not a part of my newsletter list, go ahead on and click on that button and sign up for my newsletter list because I have all kinds of content, all kinds of things on my newsletter list, things you might have missed, uh, other Facebook pages I have, like my hymn page, like my YouTube channel, like my music that, you know, uh, we don't talk about when I'm on this page or on this channel. So the one thing I want you to do to help me increase my reach is start with those of you that uh, follow me regularly or invite somebody, but click on that button that says sign up on the top of my, uh, Facebook page, which you're watching this on uh, right now, or if you're watching the replay for, replay, for those of you that are watching me live or for those of you that are watching the replay. Okay. So there's that. Now, here's the other thing I want to share. The other thing, other thing I wanted to share is, because this has been rolling around in my heart for a while. The other thing I wanted to share is I keep hearing voices talking about, when I say voices, I mean, you know, spiritual leaders, voices out there in the ether or on the internet, because gathering in person now is in the minority. The least amount of people gather together now, there are definitely still gatherings, but the least amount of people now, most of what happens now is online. So I keep hearing voices asking God to take COVID away. And I keep hearing voices asking God, when is COVID going to be over? And I keep hearing voices asking God to, you know, remove the plague from the earth and to deliver us. But what I, uh, I don't hear is voices asking God, what do we need to repent of? What do we need to do differently? What do we need to change to be more pleasing in your sight? I keep hearing the prosperity message. There ain't nothing wrong with the prosperity message. Um, there's no such thing as the prosperity gospel because prosperity has always been a part of the gospel. Obeying God has always led to prosperity and increase. And that is the promise of God that if you meditate on his word day and night, then you'll observe to do all that God commands you. And then you make your way prosperous and then you have good success. So there's no such thing as prosperity gospel as if it's a separate thing. 
prosperity has always been a part of listening to and obeying God from the beginning. Okay, Adam and Eve didn't prosper and plunge the world into sin because they did not listen to God. Had they listened to God and eaten from the tree of life instead of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they would still be alive now. None of us would be born in sin and nobody would go to hell. So there's no such thing as prosperity gospel. But I do keep hearing voices, you know, preaching about cars and houses and increasing more money and get married and nothing wrong with that. I've done that. And that stuff is something to look forward to. But again, I don't hear voices asking God what we should be repenting of. I don't hear voices asking the Lord, what do we do to get off the path? What, what do we need to turn from? And I'm basing all that on a scripture, and I'm going to go over that scripture for you in a minute. So I'm saying all that to say that normally if there's something that you think that needs to be out there and it's not out there, then maybe it's your job or your call to put it out there. So that's why I'm on here live now at four o'clock in the morning on January 1st, 2021, because I believe with my whole heart that God, God's mighty hand can take away COVID. And I believe, I know he can. And I believe with my whole heart that God wants us to prosper and be in health, even as, uh, even as our soul prospers, third John and two. But prosperity doesn't happen in disobedience. Prosperity doesn't happen in unbelief. You can't be disbelieving God and you can't be disobeying God and then think you're going to get God's prosperity because you won't. And so I don't hear any voices out there talking about, you know, how we got here and more importantly, the solution, how do we get out? How do we get past? I just hear them, you know, asking God to take it away. And they're just, just here to asking God to give me more money. But what I want to do, what we're going to do right now is we're going to look at the scripture. We're going to look at what the scripture says. That's why you hear me talk about that all the time because you have to have a, a strong foundation in all three areas of the word. There's the written word, which is the Bible. There's the living word, which is Jesus. And then there's the rhema word, the fresh breathe, fresh out his mouth right now word of God that comes normally through the prophetic. Okay, you have to have all three. Normally people hang their hats in one of those camps, but you actually have to have all three. And all these people run around talking about the prophetic isn't real, all this different kind of stuff. The entire Bible is prophetic. I want to remind you that nobody in the Bible had the Bible. We didn't have anything until Moses wrote stuff down. And Moses gave them the Ten Commandments of the law. But nobody in Scripture had the completed canon of Scripture like we do. And also, Scripture was not written in chapters and verses. Scripture was written in letters and scrolls and parchments and tablets of stone. Uh, chapters and verses come when you develop the different versions of the Bible, when you develop the King James Bible. And so we're used to referring to scriptures by their address, by, you know, the book and the chapter of the book and the verse. So book name, chapter name, verse number is how we think of scripture. That's not how people in the Bible thought of it. Nobody in the Bible thought like we do because they didn't have a Bible. What people had was they had, until Moses, they didn't have anything but their direct relationship with God because God spoke to Adam face to face and God spoke to Noah face to face. Moses started writing stuff down because he wrote the first five books in the Bible. But nobody in the Bible had the Bible like we do. They had the, the prophetic word of God. They had to go to a prophet and inquire from a word from the Lord. And then Israel had the Ark of the Covenant as well as the law. Okay. So you got to be strong in all areas of the word, the written word, which is the Bible, which we have the full scripture, the living word, which you've got to know Jesus for yourself and the prophetic word, the rhema word, which comes through the prophetic. What is the Lord saying now? So that being the case, I want to look at the scripture with the idea of COVID and everything that's going on in the world. We're going to look at a very familiar scripture, Second Chronicles 7.14. The reason this is so heavy on my heart and the reason that this is so significant, wait, uh, I'm supposed to be putting that on the right. So let me put the scripture in the chat. Chronicles. 
seven, fourteen. Okay, Second Chronicles is in the Old Testament. Go to look at Second Chronicles seven fourteen. It's a scripture that people quote a lot, but I want to look at it in more detail. Okay, Second Chronicles seven fourteen says this: New International Version. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Now, <laughs> I don't know how much more plainly the Lord can say that. I don't know how much more plainly God can tell us what to do. So that verse is like a math problem. It's like computer programming language. It says, if, then, if, then. So that means all the conditions that follow the if have to be met for the then to happen. Just like in a math problem, just like in computer pro programming language. If these conditions happen, then, and any one of my best friends is an IT manager, so he knows all about computer programming language, and so all of the conditions after the if have to be met or else it doesn't trigger the then. Uh, I stop by to tell you that that's exactly what's happening in this verse. And that's exactly what's happening out in the world right now. Which is why you hear me say quite often, don't be listening to people telling you that the Bible is old, that it's archaic, that it was written by a bunch of white men, that it's not relevant, that all that different kind of stuff. None of that is true. The Bible is the written word of God. It's real. It's true. It's alive. It's breathing. It's happening all around you right now. So this verse is set up like a math problem. It's set up like computer language, computer programming uh, language to give you a frame to help relate to what's going on in the verse because it's set up with an if then, with an if then, if then. So all these other conditions have to be met to trigger the then. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the conditions, okay? Because God is very specific. This is why these people amaze me when, when they think you just prophesy off the top of your head. <laughs> God is very specific. So it says, if my people, my people, in the Old Testament, that's the Hebrews, the Jews, the physical seed of Abraham, but also God grafted in Gentiles because Ruth was a Gentile and so was a Rahab. Uh, but it was really those that believed in Jehovah. That's what I was, because there were also Egyptians that came out of Egypt with the Israelites during the Exodus. So even though the Jews are the chosen people of God, it's by faith. It's really believing in Jehovah in the Old Testament. And so whoever believed in Jehovah would get grafted into the family. Under the New Testament, it's New Testament believers, also called Christians or Christians. Christ is not Jesus' last name. When you say Jesus Christ, Christ is not his last name. Christ means the anointed one, the Messiah. He's the one sent from heaven, anointed by God to redeem mankind. Jesus means he's going to save his people from their sins. Messiah means anointed one. He's anointed by God, sent from heaven to do exactly what he, he did and is doing. So under the New Testament, which is what we're under now, that's talking about Christians, believers, people that believe in Jesus Christ. If my people, that's what God's talking about. In other words, God doesn't expect worldly people or unbelievers to do this. God's not looking to people that don't believe in him to do this. He said, if my people, he's talking to Christians, who are called by my name, just explain that, Christians, okay? Jesus Christ, Christians, who are called by my name. Why is that important? Because the authority is in his name, okay? Jesus was, under the Old Testament, God revealed a new dimension of his name every time he did something for Israel. Jehovah Siskanu, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Jireh, the Lord our provider. Uh, so every time the Lord revealed a new dimension of himself, he, it was a part of his name under the Old Testament. So we take those lessons, but we add the lessons of the New Testament, which is uh, the name of Jesus is the name that's set above every name. So when they, uh, I like somebody said, I think it was Jesse Duplan that said, when they named it COVID-19, that I was in trouble, it's automatically defeated. Because once you put a name on it, then Jesus' name is automatically above every name that is named, which is true. So 
because I love Brother Jesse Clinton. So when you call the Lord's name, you have to understand you're calling the name that's above every other name. So as people who are called by my name, that's why the Lord's name is so important because Jesus' name is set above every other name and every name has to bow to his name. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, what does it mean to humble yourself? That can have a lot of dimensions, but basically to humble yourself means to stop trying to tell the maker what to do. So many times we come before God and we try to tell God how life goes. That's why people can't make their marriage work. You're trying to tell God how marriage works instead of letting God tell you how marriage works. He's the inventor of marriage and he's an inventor of people. So many people are trying to make their money work because you're trying to tell God how money's supposed to work. You don't tell God how money works. You let God tell you how money works. That's what it means to humble yourself. And God says, will humble themselves. Will. You have to will it. You have to make a choice. Humble yourself because you don't want God to have to humble you. God can humble you, but you don't want that. God doesn't want to have to bop you in the head to humble you. He will and he can, but he doesn't want to because he said you should humble yourself. That means you make the choice to come before him and stop trying to tell the maker what to do. Stop trying to tell the maker how all this goes because none of this is your creation. Did you ever think about that? There's nothing that you're dealing with in life that you created. But what about inventions? We build inventions based on stuff that's already there because we can't build inventions without natural law without gravity, without combustion, without all the laws of physics, without all the metal ores, without wood from the trees, everything that God already put here, we take and we combine it in different ways. And God is even the one that gives us the inspiration for those combinations. But we couldn't do any of that if God hadn't already put all that stuff in the earth realm. So you don't tell the maker how stuff goes, okay? You bow down before him and you divest yourself of your ideas and you let God tell you how something go. That's what it means to humble yourself. And so you already see right there how most of us fail. And will humble themselves and pray. And pray. Now, here come the ands. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. So that's three conditions right there. My people, believers who are called by my name, in the name of Jesus, will humble themselves. Them's the first three conditions. Now here come the ands. And pray. So you got to do the first three things and you have to pray. Now what is prayer? When we talk, that's called dialogue. When a human talks to a human. When we go vertical and we talk to God, that's called prayer. It's a separate thing. It's a sanctified thing because everything that has to do with God is separate and sanctified unto him. To pray means to talk to God. A lot of people ask, why do we need to talk to God if God already knows everything? Because sometimes people get confused with God's omniscience, his knowledge of everything, and his omnipotence, his absolute power, and his sovereignty, his power and control over everything. If God has all knowledge and God has all power and God is sovereign over everything, then why this? That's where a lot of people get confused, fill in the blank. Why does this happen or why this or why that? God says you have to do the first three things. You got to be saved. You got to use the name of Jesus. You got to humble yourself. And the first and, and you have to pray. So why do we have to talk to God? Here's why. <clears throat> I got this principle from Dr. Ivy Hilliard. So I always want to give credit where credit is due. So, you know, when I heard stuff from other ministers, <clears throat> I got this from Dr. Ivy Hilliard. Dr. Ivy Hilliard says that prayer does not inform God. Prayer invites God. So when we pray and we talk to the Lord, the reason that we're praying is not because God needs the information, but first and foremost, so you can unburden your soul. Because the Lord is the only person that can handle all of you. Now, that's my principle. I, you know, I didn't get that from anybody else. Huh? But anyway, you are never going to meet anybody in life that can handle all of you. So let me give you a principle. Here's a principle. <clears throat> I didn't get this from anybody. This is a, a DT original. People cannot handle their own sins. What makes you think they can handle yours? One more time. People cannot handle their own sins. What makes you think they can handle yours? You are never going to meet anybody because we try to do it with romantic relationships and we try to do it with spiritual leaders. 
romantically, you think out there somewhere, to, somewhere, someday is this magic perfect person that's gonna love me and the way I wanna be loved and there is a right person and you can be loved, but they human just like you. They got faults and flaws and sins just like you. And some people think, you know, if I can just find the right apostle, if I can find the right pastor, if I can right, find the right under shepherd, find the right prophet, a lot of people, um, people sending me messages. Uh, a lot of people uh, think that uh, <clears throat> that they're going to find they're going to find this perfect person and. Uh, On my prophet Dick, I'm trying to tell everybody where I am that I'm broadcasting live now. On my prophet David Taylor Facebook page. So funny how autocorrect always changed profit to profit like making money. But anyway, um, so uh, people are always trying to find that perfect past or that perfect church or perfect anything because you just want to go somewhere and unburden yourself. You can only fully unburden yourself in the presence of Christ. Christ is the only person that can handle all of you. That is why I fell in love with the Lord, because he's the only person that ever told me I, that never told me I was too something. Because everybody else I met always told me, "Well, David, you too. You you ask too many questions. You 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 too detailed. You too intense." That's what people would tell me. The Lord has never said that to me. That's why I love Jesus, because that's the only place I found in my life where he can handle all of me. And that's the way it is for all of us humans. You're never going to find anybody that can handle all of you. Okay? You can only fully unburden yourself in the presence of the Christ before the Lord. So we pray to fully unburden ourselves, to open up our souls, to cry, to laugh, to scream, to open our hearts, to tell the truth, so you can be completely honest about how you feel in front of Jesus. That's the only person you're ever going to meet in your entire life where you can always be completely honest about how you feel is Jesus. So that's the number one reason we pray to unburden our souls so we don't have to carry all the stuff in our lives. But number two, like Dr. Hillier said, we're not trying to inform the Lord like he needs the information. We're inviting the Lord. Why do you have to invite God into a situation if he has all knowledge, all power, and he's sovereign? I'll tell you why. It's, two, it's at least two reasons. First reason is because God is love. And because God is love, he's not going to force you. God is a gentleman. He's, he does not force his love or his grace on anybody. God will call you. God will convict you. God will challenge you. God will chastise you. God will cuddle you. He'll put, he'll put his arms around you and hug you and cuddle you and love you. But the one thing the Lord is not going to do is force you. He's not going to coerce you. He's not going to make you. You have to choose. You have to choose. You have to choose because there is no love if there's no choice. God wants us uh, to come to him. God wants us to let him be our God because we choose to and because we want to. And that's how you know the love is genuine because you have a choice. And so because of the Lord's love, he will never force you. If you want to walk away from Jesus today, you can. You don't have to serve the Lord if you don't choose to. He wants us to serve him because we choose to, because he loves us, and because he is love. And just like you don't want anybody to be with you because they have to be there, you want them to be there because they want to be there. That's why a lot of people are so unhappy in their marriages. Because when people start treating you like they do stuff because they feel obligated to do it, that just doesn't sit well with you. And the reason that doesn't sit well with you is because you do not want your husband or your wife doing things completely and totally out of obligation. Just rolling their eyes saying, okay, well, if we have to. That's not how you want to be married to somebody. Okay? That's not how you want your children to do things for you. Rolling their eyes about, well, okay, if I have to. That's not how you want it. You want people to do things freely because you love them. Okay, well, we get that from God. 
So God's not going to force you. The Lord is not going to coerce you. He ain't going to force you. One. Number two, because God is love. Number two, God is a just judge. And what that means is that God will always judge you justly. God judges you out of the words that come out of your mouth, and God judges you by the works of your own hands. So in other words, God judges you based on what you say, and God judges you based on what you do. You cannot possibly be more fair than that. So all these people whining, they're like, you're not fair, you're not fair, you're not fair. There ain't no such thing as fairness. <laughs> what there is is what you say and what you do. And you receive a harvest and you receive your judgment, whether good or bad, whether a crown or a curse, based on what you say and what you do. Because you going to reap what you sow. That is the judgment of God. That is the law of God. You cannot possibly be any more fair than that, that you reap what you sow, that you eat the fruit of what you say, that you eat the fruit of what you, you chose. You cannot possibly be any more just than that. But that system would not be just if you didn't have a real choice. So God gives us a choice, number one, because he is love. And God gives us a choice, number two, because he is a just judge. And that's why you have to pray. You don't have to pray because the Lord doesn't have the information. You have to pray because you're choosing to invite him into the situation. And if you've humbled yourself, you're inviting Jesus in because you believe he has a solution. So you're not running up to him trying to get him to rubber stamp on your solutions. <laughs> you're running up to him saying, Lord, you know more than I do. Okay. And you're inviting him in because he's a just judge. And he's going to judge you by what you say and do. Okay, so you have to ask him. You can't assume that you know the will of God. You can't assume he's not going to force you. That's why we pray. So I hope I cleared that up because I know a lot of people struggle with that. You have to develop a strong prayer life. you got to talk to the Lord daily. you got to start your day talking to the Lord. You have to talk to the Lord regularly. And you have to learn how to bring everything in your life under his lordship. And that's not going to happen in no weekend. <laughs> that happens over time. Okay, but you have to learn how to develop that strong prayer life. So I hope I cleared that up. So if my people are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, that's first hand. Here's the next hand. And seek my face. Why does God say that we have to seek his face? I'll tell you why. Because what we want to do is seek his hand. What we want God to do is be a genie. And the Lord will not allow us to treat him like that because that's what we want very badly. Okay, what we want is things. What we want is for situations to change. What we want is for, we just want things and circumstances. But what the Lord wants is a relationship because things are not a problem for God. How can things be a problem for God? And things are not a problem for you when you're living, making the right choices you need to make. But what we want more than anything else is to do whatever it is we want to do and then ask God to wave your mighty hand over my mess and fix it. <laughs> because we want a genie. We desperately, not casually, we desperately want God to be a genie. With the desperation, we want the Lord to be a genie. We want to just do what we want to do and then call on God and have him. That's like your teenagers just walking in your house and not saying hi and not asking you how you're doing, just saying, give me the car keys. So your son or your daughter come busting through the door Talking about, give me the car keys. How would that make you feel? Hi, dad, how you doing? Hey, mama, how's it going? How you feeling? Anything I can do for you? How's your day going? Just no pleasantries, just give me the car key. How, how would that make you feel? That's how we treat the Lord. But God said, seek my face. God wants a relationship. God wants you to know him as he knows you. God wants intimacy, face-to-face -face conversations. And God said, you have to seek it. Why? I just told you why. Because he's love. He's not going to force you. He's going to offer. He's not going to make you. And because he's a just judge, you have free choice to do what you want to do. You don't have to do anything but what you want to do. So God said, you've got to make a choice to seek a face-to-face -face relationship with me. Okay? Um, here comes another and. And turn from their wicked ways. So that's three ands. First and was and pray. Second and and sick my face. Third and 
and turn from their wicked ways. That's six things. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, first three, first three conditions, then here come the ands. And pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways. What does it mean to turn from your wicked ways? That's pr pretty self-explanatory, but in case you're not sure what the word wicked means, it means bad or evil. Bad or evil is defined however God defines bad or evil. So God defines life as anything that he is and anything that he's attached to. If you want to live, God says, then you attach yourself to me. You listen to me. You obey me. Because God says, I don't just give life. God says, I actually am life. God says, life actually, I, I'm it. So God says, if you want to live, that's with me. And life is found in keeping my commandments. Life is found in a relationship with me. Life is found in believing and obeying me, if you want to live. But anything that's outside of God, then by definition, is death. It's cursing, it's withering, it's decay, and it's death. And so God says, if you're choosing any way that's not my way, it's evil, it's wicked, it's bad, it's decaying and cursing and producing death. God said, you got to turn from that. If God says, turn, that means you have to do it. God did not say, and I will turn you. <laughs> God did not say, and I will turn you from your wicked ways. That ain't what the Lord said. The Lord said, you turn from your wicked ways. How do I know if a way is wicked? Again, the answer is in the verse. That's what prayer is for. You ask the Lord. That's what studying the scripture is for. That's why, once again, you read the scripture every day, because when you're reading the scripture, you're reading God's thoughts, commandments. You're reading with how God dealt with people in certain situations. So if you want a practical example, I'll give you a practical example. Uh, if you're married and you're attracted to and in love with somebody else, having an affair is wicked. <laughs> you took vows with this person, but not you over here getting naked and getting busy with this person. That's wicked. That's why God said, thou shalt not commit adultery. So you don't have to wonder if an affair is the will of God, that answer is always no. I can't tell you the number of times, and I know why we do it, because we get caught up in the sex, we get caught up in the emotion, we get caught up in the passion, because we think that emotion and passion and sex changes the word of God, but it doesn't. The word of God is unchanging. God is, God is so unchanging until there's not even a shadow of turning around him. He, he so doesn't change, until there's not even a shadow coming off of his light of him changing, okay? So we get caught up in emotion, we get caught up in passion, we get caught up in sex, and then we think, well, should I be with this person? Okay, an affair is always wrong. You don't have to ask God, is that the will of God? Because that's in the scripture. If you go by your feelings and you go chase your feelings and you go mess up and you go reap all the death that comes with that. But if you go by the word of God, you say, regardless of how I feel, I shouldn't go outside of my marriage and have a separate relationship. That's an example of what I mean about a wicked way. And if you're trying to figure out if something is the will of God or not, that's what the scripture is for, that's what prayer is for, that's what the Holy Ghost is for, to bring enlightenment and conviction. Because the Spirit of God will let you know if you what you're doing or choosing isn't the way the Lord wants you to live. And if it's a wicked way, it's gonna produce death. And God said, you got to turn from that. <laughs> Not I will turn you, you turn. So again, our six conditions in Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then the Bible says then. That means you got to meet them six conditions for the then to kick in. First then. And it's three uh, wills, three I wills or three wills from God. So you meet your six conditions and then God gives you three I wills. First I will, uh, first then is then I will hear from heaven. What does that tell you? That tells you that until you do them first th six things, the Lord hasn't even heard your prayer. <laughs> Why do you think people tend to specialize in praying over and over and over and over again 
as if God is hard of hearing. Do you really think the Lord is hard of hearing? Do you really think that he that made the ear cannot hear? The Bible says that, that he that made the ear is not deaf or hard of hearing, and he that made the eye, his eye is not heavy or dim, and his arm is not short. So in other words, God made our eye. I think God made it. Of course he can hear. Of course he can see. But people make big, long, elaborate prayers, these big, long speeches, and they keep praying over and over and over and over and over again. Now, I know I just told you to pray and talk to the Lord every day, but every day is a new day. I'm talking about praying about the same thing, and I'm talking about being dramatic. That is not what makes the Lord hear you. What makes the Lord hear you is in the first six conditions. Like this, you got to be called by his name. You have to humble yourself. You got to pray. You got to seek his face, and you got to turn from your wicked ways. God says, then, then I'm going to hear you. So that ought to tell you right then why a whole lot of people think their prayers haven't been answered. It's because the Lord haven't heard you because you haven't held up your end of the deal. You haven't done what you're supposed to do to get God to hear you. Because God says, all that has to happen, then I'll hear you. So that means a whole lot of praying that we've done. We're not going to do the first six. God ain't heard you. Phew. Then we get to the next I will, because there's three I will. So first I will, then I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin. So that means we got to do all that other kind of stuff, and we got to get forgiveness, because we want what we want God to do is to wipe the sin off of our account. We also want God to clear our accounts before his throne, before his face. The reason being is because sin piling up before God is no different from trash piling up in your kitchen. When the trash begins to pile up in your kitchen, eventually it's gonna hit a point where it's so piled up that you can't take it, it's gonna stink. Cause you know, there's a smell, old bad rotten food, there's that smell is awful. That's the way sin is in the nostrils of God. So when you have unconfessed sin and unrepentant of sin before God, it begins to pile up and it gets in his nostrils and it stinks. And then that's when judgment comes. So what we want him to do is forgive our sin, wipe it off of our account. We have a promise, 1 John 1, 9. When we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So forgiveness wipes it from my account. Cleansing wipes it from me. So meaning I don't have to live that way anymore. So God will wipe from my account my sins, the wicked things that I did, and then God will wipe the wickedness from my person. So I don't have to live that way anymore. So God said, I will forgive their sin as we want the Lord to do. And then there's the last, I will, and will heal their land. And that's what I've been trying to get to. The last thing the Lord says in that verse is to heal our land. That means we got to meet all six of them conditions for God to heal the land. So that's why I said at the top of this video, while I keep hearing people talking about God take COVID away and all this different kind of stuff, or God take us through or whatever, and I keep hearing, you know, prosperity, you know, getting married, you know, more money, you know, silver and gold, houses, cars, private airplanes, and nothing wrong with all that. We're supposed to have all that. But I don't hear nobody talking about what the scriptures say. <laughs> and the scripture says you've got to do all that. God says he's going to heal the land. So if we want the Lord to heal the earth from COVID, we are going to have to do those six conditions. I'm not talking to unbelievers because the scripture is not talking to unbelievers. I'm talking about the Christians. I'm talking to the saints. We can't expect God to heal the land and hold up his part of the deal until we do our part of the deal. And our part of the deal is those six things. So this is what I mean when I say, this is why you got to be strong in the Bible, the written word, you got to be strong in your face to face with Jesus and you got to be strong in the prophetic word because you're going to find the answers that you need somewhere in one of those three. It's going to be in the scripture or it's going to be something the Lord reveals to you, uh, which is going to be based on scripture or it's going to be a rhema or a prophetic word, which again will be rooted in scripture. But the Holy Ghost will confirm all of that because the spirit of God, all they had in the Bible was a prophetic word, confirmation of the Holy Ghost. They didn't have to buy like you have. So you have all three. So that's what I mean when I say, if we want God to heal the land, he already told us what to do. That means we ain't doing it. That means the Christian people 
our calling on the name of Jesus. We're not humbling ourselves. And I know we're not humbling ourselves because we're still struggling with racism. We're still being divided by ethnicity and skin, skin color. That is not the will of God. That's not biblical, okay? Divisions were still being divided by, that's why the Lord gave me that prophetic word for the beginning of the year. We're still being divided by denominations. We still got people arguing, Baptists and Methodists and United Methodists and United Methodists and AME, uh, African Methodist Episcopalian and straight Episcopalians and Presbyterians and Lutherans and Church of God in Christ and you name it, we still holding all that and God tore all that down. Don't you realize that's what 2020 was? Was God tearing all that down? Which one of you, based on your denomination, was able to stop COVID? What denominational name stopped COVID from happening? Not now one, that's what. That's what I'm trying to tell you. If you missed that, you missed the point of 2020 in terms of God has cursed religion because it denominates traditions of men and it sets at none effect the word of God and it divides us as a body. So you got people walking around saying, we can't worship with other people because they don't do it right. Because they ain't saved or they ain't saved enough for me or they don't do it like we do it. Not understanding that not every uh, not every function in the body is the same. Like God might call you to be the index finger. If you're the index finger, you are not the thumb. God might call you to be the wrist. If you're the wrist, you're not the elbow. God might call you to be the collarbone. If you're the collarbone, you're not the nose. But what we have is a nose where I that the collarbone ain't saved because the collarbone don't do what we do. We got the index finger running around talking about the thumb ain't saved because the thumb ain't like us. We got the wrist running around talking about the elbow ain't saved because the elbow don't do what we do. That isn't no. That's denominationalism, that's religion, and that is now officially cursed. So in other words, that means it's going to wither die. Ain't no life in it. It's going to wither die. If you're following denominations, denominationalism, and if you're following religion, I stop by to tell you, you're on the path of withering and death. God has called for an end to that. We're supposed to come together, united as one body of believers under the banner of the head of the church, which is Jesus. You understand that? <clears throat> the banner of the head of the church, which is Jesus. That's what we're supposed to, not skin color, not denominationalism, not religion. You understand that? And as long as we're chasing those things, those things are withering and dying and they're cursed. And that's how I know since COVID is here, we haven't done what we're supposed to do because we haven't humbled ourselves. There are plenty of people that won't worship with people of a different skin color. There are plenty of people that don't want to fellowship with people that don't do everything exactly the way they do it. There are plenty of people who think that people have to be saved enough for you or else they ain't saved. Tell me, how many people right now in China are saved? Don't Google it, don't look it up. Tell me off the top of your head. How many Christians in China? How many Christians in Japan right now? Don't Google it, do you know? Right, I thought you knew who was saved. Right, people don't have to be saved enough for you. People don't have to be saved enough for you. That's not your job trying to figure out who he is and is not saved. But you got all these people running around talking about, well, well they this and this and they that. And I'm like, well, you know, I'm just worried about it. I'm just trying to be saved. <laughs> I'm just trying to make sure I'm right with the Lord. And everybody did that. You wouldn't have time to be worried about. We ain't saved enough for you. If God does a different thing, like I'm not a pastor. So if God does a pastoral work, a shepherd's heart and somebody else, that ain't none of my business. I can't say that they not say because they may not be strong in the prophetic. They may not prophesy. That's what God uses me to do. But the pastoral is just as legitimately a five-fold ministry office and call from God as the prophetic. Same with the teaching. Same with the apostolic or evangelist. Some people are called to be an evangelist. And evangelists uh, tend to love people. They tend to travel the world because they want to get people born again and get the kingdom. But once that happens, they tend to want to move on to the next person. That's why you have pastors. Prophets, it's our job to say what well, thus saith the Lord and then let the chips fall where they may because we have to say things that other people won't say. That's why prophets, that's why we have both the personality and the training that we do. That's why we have the nature and the nurture that we have because it's our job to say stuff that other people ain't going to say and let the chips fall where they may. That's why I am who I am and the way I am because I'm a prophet. That doesn't mean that other offices are any less because they don't do it the way I do it. 
That's what I'm trying to tell you. But we're still running around. Um, when I say we, I'm talking about in America. We're still running around arguing about water baptism, arguing about eternal security. You know, once you saved, are you always saved? Or can you lose your salvation and go to hell? We're still running around arguing about the events of the end time, eschatology. How's the world going to end? Some people believe the rapture ain't real. It's figurative. Some people believe that rapture already happened. Some people believe that the rapture is in the future and it's going to be physically us lifting up off the ground and meeting Jesus in the sky. Some people don't believe in the tribulation. Some people believe the church will go through the tribulation. Some people believe the church won't go through the tribulation. Some people believe in the physical millennial reign of Christ, that Jesus is going to come all the way back to earth from heaven, set up a physical kingdom on earth in Jerusalem and reign on earth for a thousand years physically. Some people believe that that's allegorical and metaphorical and it's not actually going to happen and that the kingdom of God has already happened right now and that was never talking about an actual event. You know what I got to say? What I got to say is you can't control now one of them events. That's why I don't understand why people argue about it. I never have understood that. I never have understood people arguing about the rapture because whatever the rapture is or isn't, because the word rapture is not in the Bible, but uh, uh, whatever the rapture is or isn't, you can't control that. If the Lord steps out of heaven and stops in the sky and calls people up to him, how can you control that? You can't make yourself go. You can't make yourself stay. You can't make other people go. You can't make other people stay. You can't stop Jesus from doing that. Now, we can't hasten his coming by being obedient, but that's going to happen when he says so. So why are you tripping on that? You can't control that. If you believe in a physical millennial reign that Jesus is physically going to reign on the earth, or if you don't, if you don't believe, if you believe there's no such thing, if you believe in a tribulation period where there's a concentrated time of judgment on earth, that's the most terrible time on earth the earth has ever seen. If you believe in that, and if you believe the church will go through that, or if you believe the church won't go, go through that, or if you believe Jewish people will go through that, or if you believe Jewish people won't go through that, or if you believe that you remember at 144,000 or whatever it is you believe, you can't control nail lick of it. That's why I don't understand why people argue about it. I really don't, because you can't control nail lick of it. If the tribulation is real and it's going to happen, it's going to happen when the Lord says it's going to happen. And it's for, if it's for seven years, like the Bible indicates, then it's going to be seven years of hell on earth. Ain't nothing you can do to make that not happen. Okay? What you need to be worried about is where am I with the Christ right now? Because whatever the future events are, the Lord knows the future because it's not the future to him. Because God lives outside of time. But it is the future to us, meaning it hasn't happened yet. So to me, to me, to me, it seems like instead of arguing about future events that may or may not happen or when they may happen or if they look like what you thought, it's to me, the thing to do is make sure you're right with Christ. And then you don't have to worry about none of the rest of that. <laughs> maybe that's just me. I don't know. Maybe I'm just a silly person. I don't know. But it seems like to me, if you're right with Christ, you don't have to worry about none of that. If you write with Jesus, you don't have to worry about who's saved and who's not. If you write with Jesus, you don't have to worry about whether or not you're going to get caught up or not. If you write with Jesus, you don't have to worry about the tribulation or not, because whatever we do or don't go through, our lives are hidden in Christ before God, because Father God accepts us because of Jesus. Jesus is the thing, not us. It's his name, his blood, his death on the cross, and him reigning over all his enemies. It's all him. It's his kingdom. So it seemed like that the thing to do was be sure you ride with him. Then you have to worry about the rest of that. Seemed like to me. Okay. So that's why I knew I had to have my own platform because I couldn't say that everywhere. I know a lot of people that are going to watch this are going to be resentful of me saying that now. And my response to that is, oh, well, I'm a prophet. I got to say what the Lord tells me to say. I got to say what I feel compelled to say because that's the prophetic flow. OK, and <clears throat> that's what I mean when I say I have never understood since I was a little boy because I've watched this my whole life. I've watched person after person after person after person argue about eschatology, argue about the rapture, argue about the millennial reign of Christ, 
argue about the tribulation, argue about whether or not the church is going through the tribulation, argue about the 144,000, just over and over and over. And I'm saying to myself, you not in control of none of them events? Not in a lick of it are you in control of them events. If you're in control of those events, I challenge you to make it happen right now. How many times have people tried to prophesy the end of the world? Haven't you heard people? Just look that up. If you ain't never looked that up, look it up. Look it up, Google it, and find out how many times you've had people say the world's going to end on this day. That has happened multiple times in history. And sure enough, we're still here. That tells me that we don't get to decide <laughs> when the world's going to end. That means you're not in control of nail lick of them events. And if you are not in control of them events, why are you tripping? on something you can't control. What you can control is your relationship with the Lord right now. This vertical relationship that I have with the Christ right now, that's what we can control. So why ain't we focusing on controlling that? Okay, that's what I'm focusing on. Let me put it that way. That's what I'm focusing on. I'm not focusing on that which I cannot control, that which hasn't happened yet. I'm focusing on what I can control because all I have, the only way you experience life is moment by moment. When something's in the past, you have a memory of it. When something's in the future, you have a plan or a hope or anticipation of it, but you only experience it moment by moment. You can't experience life any other way. You can't live Tuesday and Wednesday at the same time. That might be nice, maybe, squeezing 48 hours. I don't know, but you can't do that. Okay, you can only experience life a moment at a time. So <laughs> uh, as for me in my house, because I'm not talking about anybody. That's me and my house. I'm talking about a concept. That's for me and my house. I'm spending my energy trying to make sure that I'm right with the Christ, that the Christ is pleased with me, because that's what takes care of all that other stuff that I can't control no way. And that's what the scripture says, gets the land healed. That's how I know we ain't right. If God going to tell you in the scripture these are the conditions to heal the land and the land isn't healed. What does that tell you? That tells you that we have not held up our end of the deal. We have not humbled ourselves. We're still divided over foolishness, over things we can't control, over skin color. We seek in his hand and not his face. God, do this for me. That's like the kids walking in and saying, give me the car keys. That's not what God said. God said, I want a relationship. Face to face. We got to hold up our end of the deal. Then healing comes. God said, I will. If God said, I will, then he will. Because he is equal to his word. If a promise comes out of the mouth of the Lord, he going to hold up his end of the deal. I will hear from heaven. God said, I'll hear you. God said, I'll forgive your sin. And God said, I will heal your land. Heal. I'm sorry, I keep crunching that word. I will heal your land. So if we want to be heard. And we want to be forgiven and we want a, the land to be healed, we got to do them six things. I, this is not rocket science, okay? And that's how I know we haven't been doing them as a body. Because if we were doing what we were supposed to be doing as a body, like the scriptures say, then all the other stuff would kick in because the Lord would do his part. So that's what I'm here to say, because I'm not hearing that that much out there in the ether, then that's why I had to come on and release it and say it myself. So, so I could at least be a voice out there putting out there what I think is missing, okay? And Second Chronicles seven fourteen is what I think is missing in the conversation. And there you have it. All right, so I just wanted to come on and share that. God bless you so much. Uh, so I'll be back on uh, the second Thursday for No More Genies, and then I'll be back that following Sunday for my next live. But I just wanted to put this out here because I felt compelled to do this, all right? So remember I told you at the top of the hour, my goal for 2021, my goal for 2021 is to increase my reach because I do believe the Spirit of God speaks through me, and I do believe that I'm a voice of value, and I do believe that as others have blessed me because they release the Word of God, I want to be a blessing so that the word of God that God puts in me can also be released. So every time I come on, I'm going to ask you to do one thing, because I can't do that. I cannot increase my reach without help. And so the one thing I'm asking you to do in this video 
is on my Facebook page, there's a sign up button at the top. Click that button and sign up for my newsletter list because in my newsletter list, I have all kinds of content, uh, content on my other pages, my music pages, stuff you might have missed. So click on that button and get on the newsletter list. That's the one thing I'm doing to ask you to help me increase my reach in this video. Okay, amen and God bless. I will see you in a couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, don't forget to check out the prophetic locator words. I will, in fact, let me do that right now, put the prophetic locator words in the chat so you can see them. A prophetic locator word is doing what I just said, is asking the Lord to give you your grades. It's asking the Lord to locate you in the spirit. Where am I with you, Jesus? What are you pleased with? What are you not pleased with? Hey, man, there's Lisa. Happy New Year to you, too. So the prophetic locator word is designed by God to uh, do what Revelation 2 and 3 says for the Lord to give you your grades. How, where are you with the Lord? How are you walking with Christ? Is the Lord pleased? And I was amazed when I found out that there are plenty of believers that live their whole lives and never ask the Lord, how am I doing? And never ask the Lord, are you pleased with me? Are you pleased with what you're seeing? Should I be doing anything differently? And never bother to ask the Lord stuff like that. So these prof prophetic locator words are words designed at the end of every year and at the beginning of every year to teach you how to go before the Lord and hear what the Lord is saying, both in your personal life, on a national level, all that. So I'll put those in the chat so you can check those out if you already, haven't already seen them. So again, one thing I want you to do is click the sign up button, get on my newsletter list. I will be back in a couple of weeks on Thursday night for No More Genies. Have a blessed, prosperous new year. And remember, the thing to do is to get right with Christ and you won't have to worry about the rest. <laughs> All right, we got to meet them, meet them six conditions so God can hear us, forgive us, and heal the land. Amen and God bless.